It's great to be here. It's great to let the physicist, to let a social scientist uh, try our best here, at least once. Um, so what I want to talk to you today about is this sort of, in some sense, burgeoning new field of collective intelligence. And the uh, social scientist Thomas Schelling, who won the Nobel Prize in economics, um, once said, you know, in describing how these systems work, said, you know, if you're in the mood to be amazed, right, just sort of sit back and watch. So this is what we mean by collective intelligence. Here's a whole bunch of ants. And, they're actually not that much smarter than, say, your typical Ohio State student. <laughs> and yet, collectively, I have to say that having gone to Michigan, Wisconsin, Northwestern, they've, they've taken it to us pretty hard over the last decade. But watch, um, watch how these ants sort of collectively, you know, there's no central leader, there's no managing ant standing on top of a podium sort of directing people, and yet they sort of can capture and take this giant millipede. Right? So that's one type of collective intelligence, but we also think about collective intelligence in terms of groups of people. So this is a project funded by DARPA called Folded, and this is a protein. And what you're trying to do is do this protein folding and try to get it at a minimal energy state. And the people who played this were a bunch of sort of people who actually study biochemistry and also a bunch of like 13, 14 year old gamers who just like moving things around. And when they started this project, they were, they were just kind of thought this would be fun. But then what happened is, is they found out that these gamers were really good at manipulating these proteins and finding new configurations. In fact, one of the proteins they found after just 10 days was um, instrumental in sort of identifying the H um, this protein involved in HIV, and it's something that research has been working on for over a decade. So this whole idea of using crowds of people, using collectives to solve things, has led to this sort of burgeoning growth of crowdsourcing platforms, collective intelligence platforms. So on the web, you'll hear things about it, sort of like you know, online communities, mass collaborations, open innovation, crowd intelligence, all that sort of stuff. These are all going to be examples of collective intelligence. Now, this is a, a tough talk to give for the following reason, is that this field is so large and it spans so many different disciplines that no one's really an expert in it. So the work I'm going to describe today is only going to be in a small part my own work. And so I'm really, you know, to quote the Beatles here, I'm going to get by with a little help from my friends. So the work I talk about today is going to be, you know, maybe one seventeenth mine and one seventeenth all of these people. And these people span like Dirk Helbing is a physicist, Elaine Landemore is a philosopher, Jessica Flack is a biologist, Anita Woolley does work in um, organizational behavior, Regina Dugan, some of you may know, used to run DARPA, and Duncan Watts is at Microsoft Research. So you've just got people sort of all over the map who try and understand how this stuff works. So here's the outline. What I want to do is I want to start up by just sort of giving you Collective Intelligence 101. What do we mean when we say collective intelligence? Then what I'm going to do is I want to unpack it. I want to sort of do a, give a logic or taxonomy for what, where collective intelligence comes from. And that's going to be sort of a static view. What do I mean by that? I'm going to mean sort of we have a set problem, a set task. How does the collective sort of get the task right? Then I'll very briefly talk about collective intelligence in complex systems, which gets a lot harder. And if we look at the state of the literature at the moment, I think we've we're doing pretty well on point two. We're still kind of you know, at ground zero on point three. And then I'll talk about the fourth point, the challenges related to diversity. So where I plug into this literature is I've been trying to figure out how is it that we get collective intelligence and what role does diversity play? So the things that sort of play central roles are gonna be sort of you know, the skill sets or the perceptual abilities of the parts, and those are gonna to have to be diverse, how those parts are connected, and how those parts adapt. So of those three sort of central parts, my research is focused on diversity, and so we'll talk about sort of how that works. Okay, so let's go to sort of 101. What do we mean by collective intelligence? What we mean is, it's when a collective somehow has better performance or has a functionally distinct property that the parts don't have. So what do I mean by that? So better performance, I mean, crowds are just better at identifying, solving, predicting, verifying, creating, right? So if you do head-to-head -head competitions between individuals and groups, groups win. That's what we mean by collective intelligence. What do I mean by different functionality? So if you think of the brain, right, individual neurons, you know, can exhibit cognition or consciousness or personality. Those are all sort of emergent phenomena. Culture in a society isn't contained in a person, right? It sort of emerges from these interactions. 
a system can be robust, right? But it's sort of an individual part of that system can't be robust. And then if we think of complexity as some, something that also can emerge from these systems, so when I think about when I have this sort of system of interacting things, they can produce these functionalities that the things themselves can't. I'm a social scientist, so when social scientists think about collective intelligence, we think this has to be structured some way in the form of institutions, right? So if we don't have institutions, we're just going to be kind of running around hitting ourselves with clubs, right? And there's really four basic classes of institutions, markets, hierarchies, democracies, and then commons, sort of collective commons, which are sometimes thought of sort of ecologies. And this fourth category, 30, 40 years ago, we didn't really think of, right? We used to get sort of, they used to teach classes in the 1970s called markets, hierarchies, and democracies. In fact, I took one at Northwestern. Um, but more recently, with new technologies, we also think about sort of these sort of almost sort of ecological things, like these open source crowdsourcing things, where we sort of organize society. So markets, and I'm not going to read these things, but I'll just put these in the slides so people can sort of glance over them. When you think about markets, what we think about is markets create incentives for people to sort of accumulate diverse knowledge, diverse skills, diverse understandings, and it's this sort of incompleteness of each of our individual knowledge but the collective completeness of our knowledge that allows markets to work. So sort of a paradoxical thing here is a lot of the people who study collective intelligence fall on the spectrum politically, right? Because the thing is, if you're really pro-market, you're a big collective intelligence person, right? We'll also assume like the eco ecological stuff, a lot of environmentalists are also collective intelligence persons, okay? So here's sort of the graph that people like to put up about how markets have been fairly successful Right, if you look leading up to the, here's per capita GDP prior to the Industrial Revolution, and after, if you look closely, you can see a kink in that graph, right about 1900, okay. Now with organizations, the interesting thing about organizations, and Herb Simon, who won a Nobel Prize in economics as well, when he talks about organizations, he says, look, each individual person is boundedly rational. Maybe not as much as the ants, but we're really not that good, and yet organizations can do these amazing things. So there's functionality of organizations that people don't have. So organizations exhibit collective intelligence. So if you look at Google, Facebook, or Apple, this is their revenue per employee. So even if you've got a very inflated sense of yourself, and you work at one of these companies, <laughs> it's really hard to think, yeah, I probably was worth about 1.85 million this year, right? So for a group of people, for an individual to produce this much value, it has to be the case, right, that they're organized in some way. And this was sort of Simon's point. Now, democracies, right, and this goes back to Plato, also sort of sometimes exhibit <laughs> collective intelligence, right? And one of the points here is Elaine's got this wonderful quote. She has a book on collective intelligence, and she talks about the knowledge of which cannot reside within any one individual or within a few of them. And the reason we need a collective is so that collectively we can understand. Now, at the moment around the world, democracy is, you know, people are questioning whether it's working. But let's just put up, let me put three slides to show you that it does. So this is um, percentage of people who are satisfied, and this is a democratic score. And what you see is you see a really nice slope. This is life expectancy by government type. And the one that you see at the very top are full democracies. The next is partial democracies. And the democracies do much worse. And if you look at things like this is a democracy index running along the bottom and the extent of gender inequality going up and down, and you see that there's just more equality the more democratic the country is. So at very, very broad strokes, democracy works. Okay, the fourth type of organization that's gonna matter for getting collective intelligence are sort of these, these ecologies and these commons. And Deborah Gordon um, is really sort of the, the expert on this. She's at Stanford, and she talks about how these social insects like the ants that we just saw are able to collectively do sort of amazing things that each one can't, such as build bridges, right? And again, there is no engineer standing there. Alec Gallimore is not standing there saying, you go here, you go here, right? They're just sort of collectively doing this. This same sort of idea, now that we have new internet, now that we have the internet, now that we have these smartphones, works in things like the creative commons, right? Where there's groups of people without any necessarily organizational structure, just collectively solving problems, posing problems, helping each other out, right? That's why they have no money, right? And just people sharing things. Okay, so what we want to do is we understand the logic of how collective intelligence works. So we know what it is, right? It's somehow that groups of people can do amazing things that individuals can't. Groups of ants can do amazing things. So what's the logic of it? Now to present the logic, what I've got to do is I've got to start with something called the wisdom hierarchy. So this is going to be the core lattice that I use throughout the talk, right? The framework that I'm going to lay everything on top of. And it starts like this. At the bottom is data. Right? It's just all the, the stuff that's out there. This could be DNA, this could be the food the ants are trying to get, this could be every single 
trade that's happening in an economy. There's transaction data. There's genomic data, right? Data, 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 we're washing data. On top of data is information. Now, the distinction between data and information is important because information is how we sort of bin the data, right? So psychologists have this phrase, lump to live, right? That if we didn't lump things into categories, we couldn't possibly make any inferences. So if I step out in the street and I see something coming and I think, it looks like a 1978 Ford Ranger pickup truck with blue stripes, I'm gonna get run over. <laughs> what I've gotta do is I've gotta go truck hit me and step out of the way, right? So we make these categories, sometimes they're fine, sometimes they're, cr they're crude like that in order to draw influences. So we, recently I was with my, with my family in um, New York and MoMA had this exhibit of the 110, I think it was 110 um, important fashion items over the last decade. And as mentioned, I'm from Yankee Springs, Michigan, and so Yankee Springs, Michigan isn't exactly a fashion hotbed, <laughs> let's just say. So I was quite pleased to see that like painter's pants, red bandanas, and converse all-stars all made the list. You know, I just made three of them. Now the interesting thing is, so this is in some sense the data, right? These are the fashion items. And what they did is they said, well, you know, you could, we can categorize these things according, this is on the, you can't really read this very well, on the, on the far right side of these are the 17 sort of um, UN goals, sort of sustainability goals. And what you can do is you can take each one of these products and you can sort of categorize them. Like, how are they doing on those goals? And what's interesting is you can sort of watch them, right? So this is taking all that data and putting into categories. Like, are they good for the environment, right? Are they good for workers? Are they, you know, this sort of thing, right? And there's particular products like Levi's 501 jeans, which used to be really bad for the environment because they were acid washed. That involves acid, right? It's much better to sort of cut them with solar powered lasers, which is what they do now. Okay, so now we've got this data. It's turned into these boxes, which we can think of as categories, right? And that's one part of what sort of intelligence is, right? It's sort of taking this world that's a messy place and putting it in boxes. The next thing, knowledge, is sort of understanding causal and correlative relationships between that knowledge. So, for example, I was involved with a group funded by the British government called Foresight, and they said, you know, can you just sort of figure out what's causing obesity? And we said, sure. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> right? So... Each, you can't really read that, but each one of those boxes says things like giant cokes, lack of sidewalks, genetics, right? Anything you can possibly imagine, right? They contribute, and those little arrows are the causal relationships in our hierarchy, right, between those pieces of information. At the very top is wisdom, and we can think, I'm going to sort of use wisdom and intelligence synonymously here, right? So what happens is there's data out there, we put it in boxes, we have relationships between it, and then intelligence or wisdom comes in sort of figuring out what to do with that knowledge, okay? And that's gonna play out in different ways. So that's what we wanna unpack, but that's at the core, right? Data, information, knowledge, wisdom, and we wanna ask how that happens. So let's start. One way it happens, one way we get collective intelligence is through partitioning. So this is the Red Balloon Challenge. So in 2011, Regina Dugan, who was in that graph, to celebrate DARPA's 20th, 40th anniversary, said, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna hide 20 or 10 red weather balloons across America. And if, whoever can find them first will give $40,000 to, right? And MIT ends up winning this. They find them in nine hours, which is amazing, right? They're just sending out emails. Anybody see a red balloon? We'll come back to how they do it later. But what's amazing is people could, that they were able to do this in nine hours. And a couple other teams finished just after them. How does this work? Well, let's think about it in our hierarchy. There's all this data out there, and the data are these red balloons, right? But it's all that's happening here, the collective intelligence is just partitioning. There's some people in Texas where there's a balloon, there's people in Oregon where there's a balloon, there's people in Florida where there's a balloon. And so the person in Florida who saw the balloon said, hey, just saw a red balloon, right? But that person can't see the red balloon in Texas, right? It has to be someone in Texas. So what's happening here, collective intelligence is literally just coming from the fact that like, when you've got a whole group of people, you can partition the world, you can partition the data, and then you can just sort of send it up the hierarchy. So there's nothing really very complicated there, okay? The next thing, now we'll get more complicated, is averaging. So there's a book that came out by Jim Sirwicky called The Wisdom of Crowds. And in this book, he talks about the 1906 West of England Fat Stock and Poultry Exhibition. 787 people guessed the weight of a steer. Average guess is 1197 pounds. The steer weighs 1198 pounds. So they're within a pound. Now, I grew up in the shadow of Michigan State, sort of. I teach here. People often confuse those two universities outside of here. This is a graph made by someone at the University of Michigan, not by someone at Michigan State, because this is a graph of a steer 
as drawn by someone at the University of Michigan. <laughs> so, <laughs> state fans can stand proud right there. Okay. So, now, you can tell anecdotes, but what we try and do at universities is move right from anecdote to scientific knowledge. And in this area of collective intelligence, my um, late colleague Michael Cohen used to say, we're at this space, this was about 15 years ago, where it's kind of a festival of bad metaphors. And what we want to do is this move from the festival of bad metaphors to science. And so here's one place where we can sort of like just pin something down, like at least pin the leg of the frog down. If you've got a group of people making prediction, the crowd's error equals the average error of the people in the crowd minus the diversity of their prediction. So if you've got, so what makes a crowd smart when predicting? So how do you get collective intelligence when you're predicting? You get it by having people who are smart, that's gonna be a low average error, and having those people use diverse models. Why? Okay, so my friend Barry's in the audience. Barry and I think about the world in different ways. Somebody says, what's gonna to happen to the stock price? And so is we're both pretty good, we're both off by like maybe five or six bucks. So one possibility, he's six too high and I'm six too high. In that case, we're about the same. Now the possibility is he's six too high, I'm, she's six too low, I'm six too low. Again, the crowd's about the same as each person. But there's also the possibility that he's six too high and I'm six too low, and then when you average this, you get it exactly right. Now what's going on there is the fact that each of us, when you go to that, each of us sees all that data, but we only see different parts of it. Each of us constructs models, right? That's our knowledge, but we're constructing different knowledge. And that different knowledge is gonna give us good predictions, hopefully, fairly low average error, but also different predictions, okay? So as important as cattle are, there's other stuff that may be more important, but here's the data from Galton Steer, right? So the crowd is off by less than a pound, right? But on average, people are, up, I'm sorry, the crowd's off by 1.4 pounds, when you squared it's two. People on average are off by about 70 pounds, but they also happen to be diverse. But let's look at something much, you know, sort of more important. So this is data, this is some work by Jack Sowell, 28,000 forecasts by professional economists over 40 years. So like in the European Union, every quarter, they make estimates on the six main economic indicators, right? So unemployment, inflation, all that sort of stuff, right? The crowd, so there's 43 of them in that case. In other cases, there's 26. This is kind of all the big predictions around the globe from the US and the European Union on these six indicators over a 40 year period. The crowd is 21% better than the average economist. 21%, so this is what we mean. So it's not like, oh, this is some cute little thing, 21% better, right? Here's a fabulous graph. So the red dot at the top is one. That's just benchmarking an average economist. As you move down at the number of economists is on the bottom. As you just add a second economist, you get 7% better. You add a third economist, you get 11% better. So you're just adding other people. You're not, you're not adding smarter economists. You're just adding random economists. But you do better because they're, di they're different. Now the purple line is the best economist. So the best economist is 10% better. When you add in the second best economist with the best economist, you get 16% better. That should be counterintuitive, right? This is why diversity is so important to collective intelligence, right? Best one's 10% better, second best one's 9% better, you average them together, 16% better, right? So if you have a portfolio of stocks, one gets eight, one gets 12, one gets four, one loses eight, you get 5%. If you have four economists, take the four best economists in each one of these little studies. So if there's 43 in this one, they take the top four. If there's 17 in this one, they take the top four. On average, the best one's 10% better. Second best is 9% better. Third best is 9% better. Fourth best is 8% better. If you average those four, you do 22% better. Okay? So this is what we mean by collective intelligence. Okay? So what's happening here in our hierarchy? What's happening here is each one of these economists is looking at different data. There's some overlap, but they're looking at some different stuff. Each one has different models, represented by the triangle, the circle, the hexagon and stuff, right? And then we just add them up. So there's nothing really that elaborate going on, right? This is just sum them up, divide by four, right, in this case. But it turns out, when you do the math, and this is why we do the math, that summing up and dividing by four gives you a bonus, right, if they happen to have different models. Now, some of you who study, some of you have like done any, work on like AI or deep learning or you just looked at those graphs, you might think, you know, this picture looks a lot like that, those deep learning graphs I keep seeing in the Wall Street Journal and stuff. And it is, because how do these deep learning algorithms work? Well, there's an input layer, data. 
It goes into a hidden layer, which puts the data into like themes or categories, information. There's a hidden, second hidden layer, which basically finds connections between those categories, knowledge. And then there's an output layer, which weights the different models, which is hopefully wisdom, right? So the big deep learning framework, right, is exactly the same as this data information knowledge wisdom thing from an, as, as an analogy, right? You can map each part to each part. So we've talked about partitioning, right? We've talked about summing up. Now we'll do unions, and this is kind of, what is my, sort of my favorite thing in this space. There's something called the alternative uses test. What they say is, here's a brick, think of as many uses of a brick as you possibly can, right? So you might think, I can use it as an anchor for my boat, I can put it behind my car tires so my car doesn't roll. The strangest answer ever given, I can use it as a coffin in my Barbie set. <laughs> okay? And the more uses you have, right, the more creative you are. So I was at the um, Fed Reserve Bank in New York, and for fun, we're talking about what are the different uses for blockchain technology, right, that they use for Bitcoin. And so these are some answers that people gave. The names have been changed to protect the innocent sort of thing here. So let's call these people Arun, Betty, and Carlos. So Arun thought you could use it for, you know, just to keep track of data. You can use it for hospital records. You can use it for regulatory things. You can use it for scientific advancement. Betty had a bunch of reasons. Carlos didn't. You can think of the creativity of each person. So Betty has the highest creativity, which is seven. And then Arun's is six, and Carlos is six, because she had the most ideas. But when we think about how creative, right, why are groups more creative, we just take the union. Nothing complicated, right? And so the union's going to have a creativity of nine. Now, the interesting thing here, right, is that even though Betty has the most ideas, she doesn't necessarily add the most value to the group because it depends on do you have unique ideas that nobody else has. And if you do that, Arun actually ends up being the person who matters most. But this is exactly how sort of Google's map thing works, right? When you're in your car, right, you're just sending in how fast you're going, and they're just kind of taking the union of all that information, right? So collective intelligence is just coming from just sort of taking everything and putting it in a big pile. So if we think of it in terms of our map, right, all this stuff is getting set up, and we're just taking sort of the union of, so here's all these things that each, each piece of knowledge each one of us has, and then we're just sort of handing that set over to everyone. Fourth one, and I'm going to go a little bit deeper dive into this just because it's kind of fun, and it'll get at the point of why collective intelligence can be so difficult in some cases. Because these first three cases, it just seems too good to be true, and it kind of is. So here's where it gets harder. This is sort of verifying the truth. They're getting at the truth. And for those of you that took the LSAT, whew, let it go. It's been a long time ago. Let it go. Okay? So we're going to do the LSAT. I just want you to prepare because this, this next slide can scare a lot of people. This is the famous seven choose five dinosaurs problem where... Each of seven dinosaurs, and here's the type, right, are hanging out at a party. And uh, you've got to figure out which order they can be in. And they give you all this information, right? And you have exactly six minutes to do this before you move on to the next question or you don't get into law school, right? So that's how these things work. Now, what we want to do is we want to sort of say, so what happens here is you alone have to solve this, right? But what we want to think about is how would we solve this if we wanted to have a, a team of people or a collection of people solve this where we gave each person one piece of information, right? So the first thing we gotta do is we gotta start, the question here was, here's the information, which of these orders is possible, right? So I'm gonna do some notation, I stands for iguanodon, you know, so on, right? So we don't need to go through this, but I'm just gonna give each one of these different types of dinosaurs a letter. So what I can do is I can say, okay, if I was solving this, I would say here's the 21 possibilities, right? So here's all the different orders I could possibly have for these five choosing these seven dinosaurs, right? And then putting them in order. So one person, so I did this in my, so this is the sort of thing, I teach this class on collective intelligence, and this is an exercise we do. So I, one person has a little card that says there are exactly two blue toys. And then she's like, that doesn't help me at all. Right, so she has information, namely that there's two blue toys, and she knows the list of 21 possibilities, and she says, here's how much I can help. Not at all. I'm totally useless. The next person says, the stegosaur is red and is included in the group. So this person can knock it down to 19, right? And can paint the little stegosaur red. The third person says the iguanodon is included only if it's green. So now it says, okay, now I can color the iguanodon green in those cases when the iguanodon's in there and it's not in there, it doesn't matter. 
And the same thing for the site next person. The platosaurus is included on it's yellow. So individually, each of these people is walking around saying, I have some information, but collectively, right, it's not getting him very far. And then this other last person has the, the cell raptors included only if the ultrasaur is not. Now this person's like, oh great, I can cut it down to 15. So this person actually feels like at least they know something, right? But the other ones, for the most part, don't feel like they know very much. Now, as an analogy, you want to think of something like the combustion engine, right? The combustion engine consists of a whole bunch of fairly simple parts. Those parts were known probably 15 to 20 years, depending on who you talk to, before somebody actually came up with the combustion engine because they were in the heads of different people, right? So a lot of innovation comes from sort of combining particular things, right? Particular bits of knowledge. But if those particular bits of knowledge are held in different people's head, Right? I was talking about this with the grad student right before the lecture. You've got to be able to communicate those ideas to one another, and you've got to know somebody else needs to know that piece of information. So the students are walking around the room, and they each basically feel like they don't know anything, but collectively, they know the answer. Let's see why. Right? So, I'm sorry, I guess there's one more person. If both the lambasaur and the ultrasaur are included, at least one of them is blue, this person is like, wow, that's a lot of information that tells me nothing. Right? But now if I combine the two, the cell raptor is included only if the ultrasaur is not, and that the stegosaurus is included in red, suddenly it drops down to nine. Just as soon as those two people talk, they're like, hey, wait a minute, you know this, I know that, now we're down to nine. That's pretty cool. And then we know the iguanodon is included if and only if it's green, the platosaurus is included if it's yellow, we're still only down to nine, but now we can color code a lot of them. And then they talk to this person, and he says, if and it's, he goes, hey, if both those two things are in there, at least one of them is not blue, and there's exactly two blue toys, so they can knock out this one case, okay? So now they're down to eight, and they go back and look at the question that says which of these things are possible, and it turns out only one of those is possible, okay? So what we did in class, which is really fun, is we took a whole bunch of different LSAT questions, and we figured out how hard they were based on how many people had to solve them, right? So one of the things that comes from this right away is that if if a problem is small enough, and this is straight out of, let's go back to the Herb Simon bounded rationality organization thing. If a problem is small enough so that one person can keep all the information in his or her head and then solve it, oh my gosh, have that one person solve it, right? But once it gets too large, then you need to have, think back to the obesity graph, the knowledge has got to be contained in a whole bunch of different heads, and now collective intelligence looks a little bit harder to achieve, right? Because everybody's got to talk with everybody else, okay? So here's what's going on here. There's data, there's informology, there's information, there's knowledge. The knowledge in this case is what are the sort of things that could be possible, and wisdom or intelligence comes in the form of sort of taking the intersection of those sets, right? So this one we suddenly think, whoa, this is a lot harder than the ones we've done before. Okay, last one, integrating. So if you think about problem solving, people talk a lot about sort of um, problem solving is sort of search over a rugged landscape, right? So there's a set of possibilities, and each possibility has a value. And what I'm kind of doing is like trying to find a high point on a hill. So problem A here is pretty easy, right? Because it's just a single hill. B gets harder, right? C is a little bit harder, and D is practically impossible. But if you look at this picture, this is kind of, you can, you can think of this as a metaphor of people finding a solution to an academic problem. You can also think of this as bees trying to find food. So this could be the distribution of pollen, right, in an environment. So bees solve this by doing a thing called a waggle dance. Right? And so what they do is they fly around, and if they find food, they come back, and they can't kind of like write a memo right? when they come back. They're limited in their sort of communication repertoire. So what they do is they do this dance, and they basically dance, like, I think I have a video, because it's probably, bees probably slightly better at this than I have. They've been genetically selected for it. Oops, it's not going to go. Let's see. Oops, it's not going to go. So the bees, um, the bees do this dance, but what they do is they dance in the direction that the food is, and then the length of the dance basically tells how much food there is there. So here's the next experiment I did in my collective intelligence class with my undergraduates. I broke them into two groups. One group I called people, and they acted like people. The other group I called bees, and they had to act like bees. So what we did is we created a landscape like this, and the people could sit around and do what people do, have a committee meeting, and they could say, where should we look for the food? And then they would look, like they want to find the highest point. They would look, they would check five points. They got information back on how high those five points were. They could check five more points. They got information back on those five points. 
they could check five more points. And they did this until they checked a total of 60, 50 points. The bees did the same thing, except for the bees couldn't talk at all. Each one kind of went out and just kind of pointed to a place on this grid, and then came back and waggle danced. Now, it turns out, getting undergraduates to waggle dance, not easy, <laughs> right? So we sort of changed the rules after like some people just weren't bringing it to uh, people just waggle danced with their hands. So they would go like this and like this, right? So, so I basically got Michigan undergrads who are freakishly smart trying to figure out, okay, how do we optimally search this, but they're handcuffed by the fact that they're doing this in a committee, versus a bunch of bees who are just kind of like randomly looking and just sort of like, they'd come back and they'd just point on a, on a square on the chalkboard saying, here's kind of where I searched, and go like this, right? So if you compare how they did on this particular, so we did a bunch of different landscapes. So this is one of the you know, relatively hard ones. There's three peaks, one of them's higher. Here's how the people did, and here's how the ants did. Basically the same. And across all the problems I've done in this, the bees have always done as well, or the ants have always done as well. As the, the bees, I'm sorry, have always done as well as people. It says ants, it should say bees. Um, they've done equally well. And what's funny is afterwards, the students will say, well, of course they did as well, because all they have to do is take the derivative. It's like, right, those bees are out there taking derivatives. They all took, <laughs> they all took calc. There's probably some of them in here right now, Saturday morning physics, soaking in knowledge, right? But what he meant, which is absolutely right, is like, like bees can basically tell you roughly how high it is, right? And if another bee goes a little bit longer, they can kind of figure out the slope in the hill, right, by pointing at the regions. And so that collect, and so the people kind of had way too much information to solve these sorts of problems. So it's interesting, right, as you can see that sometimes collective intelligence doesn't demand the groups being that smart. So then the question is, what makes them smart? And in this case, what makes them smart, kind of like the red balloon thing, is they're checking different parts of the space. So there's a lot of literature in this space, and I'll start with a paper of my, my own with Lou Hong. If you say on one of these problem-solving things that um, people have representations of the problem, and then they have heuristics that they use to solve the problem, what you find is if you start with a group of really smart people, you're better off randomly selecting people than taking the very best people, because the very best people end up being the same. So what you get is diversity seems to really sort of matter here. Then there's a paper by Marco Lino Zhang and Tom Bay. They said, suppose what we're doing is finding strategies playing Go, and I've just got algorithms out there, and I want to see how, how smart is a collection of algorithms. They find the exact same thing, that a team of good algorithm beats a team of sort of, if you take the very best algorithm, you have a bunch of them that are kind of like that. A team of diverse algorithms does better, and the reason why is because they're not always thinking about the problem sort of in the same way. They're looking in different parts of the space. So then, um, Maitha Roju and John Kleinberg said, let's suppose it's this way. Suppose, kind of like in the bees thing, that each person says, hey, here's a bunch of things I've found. And somebody else says, here's a bunch of things I've found. And then what happens is um, you do something with those sets of things, right? What they find, which is really interesting, is they say, for many supermodular functions, and Kleinberg's a certified genius, so he can use words like this. He's a MacArthur Foundation genius. So he says supermodular. The rest of us would say nonlinear. What he means here is that if anything interesting is happening in the interaction, if we're doing something other than just like taking the best one, then you're going to get the same phenomenon. What's going to happen is if you want to pick sort of the team that's going to be most collectively intelligent, you don't want to pick the best people. And in fact, he shows something more that there's no test you could apply to individuals such that the highest performing people on that test would be the best team. Then Lu Hong has a new result I'll give for full credit for it, that says this actually generalizes a lot. So as soon as the thing becomes kind of hard in any sort of way, you don't want to assign a single test because what you really want is to go back to the data, information, knowledge, wisdom. You need that diversity all the way up if people are bounded. Okay. So how does this play out sort of in the data? This is a, this is a made up graph by me because this paper isn't published. So Anita, this is Anita Woolley, she said I can kind of just fake it. But they do this thing where they measure cognitive diversity. Look at this is collective IQ of the team on the side. And you get this kind of horseshoe shape or inverted U shape. And the reason why is let's go back to the sort of LSAT question thing. If the group gets too diverse in some of these settings, this is experiments with people, it's harder to communicate with one another, right? You get communication loss and you sort of fall off. But if you're not diverse, you don't just want what they find in a series, oh, they've done a ton of studies in this space, is that individual IQ doesn't actually load that well from a regression standpoint to group IQ. 
right, which is exactly what those theoretical results claim should be true, that the best groups don't consist of the best people unless you've got massive variation in IQ, right? So if we were to take just a couple people that always go to Saturday morning physics and other people that are like out watching cartoons, we'd only want the Saturday morning physics people, right? But if we were selecting from in here, right, we wouldn't want to use IQ as a predictor. We'd want to look for other things, okay? Oops. Um, here's an example of that, which is kind of fun. This is something called Top Coder, where students compete to try and find a better computer science, better algorithm to solve a problem. And what each dot is a submitted program. And as you move down, the program is running faster and faster in terms of speed, and it's more efficient. And what you can see is you, the red line is sort of the best to date. And what you see here is you see that over time, this thing is being improved upon. And this sort of constant improvement is the collective intelligence of the crowd. But each one of these little breakthroughs is someone sort of just having one little trick, one little heuristic on top of something else that someone did. Right? So this is sort of a really wonderful way of seeing. And the other thing you should see here, notice how many bad ideas there are. Right? Typically in these spaces, there's going to be just as many or many more bad ideas than good ideas. So in these cases, right, what we're doing is we've got all this data out there. It's being partitioned into knowledge, with, uh, partitioned into information and then knowledge. And then what we've got to do is somehow got to like combine that in interesting ways. This is also then hard. Okay. So the summary is there's some stuff, partitioning and averaging in unions, pretty easy. There's other stuff, intersecting and integrating, not so easy. So if you read books like crowdsourcing, smart mobs, wisdom of crowds, those sorts of things, they're filled with examples of one, two, and three. There aren't as many examples in four and five. Four and five, you've got to go back to sort of Herb Simon and think about how do you construct organizations to get those things to work. Okay, so now let's sort of jump to the frontiers where we don't know much, so this will be faster. I've taken these as fixed problems. Solve the SAT problem, write computer code, find the 10 balloons. We finish it, we go home, we have dinner, we get up the next morning and somebody hands us a different problem. But in uh, my work in the Center for the Study of Complex Systems here, complex systems never stop, right? They keep adapting. So I want to change this graph a little bit. And instead of thinking of wisdom on the top, I want to think of an action on the top. So I want to think of there being a person or an organization or something sort of moving up this hierarchy and then saying, based on what I know, I'm going to do this. Right? When you think about dynamic collective intelligence, my this becomes part of the data the next period. Right? And this is an idea that goes back to Chris Langton, who is a graduate student here, John Holland, who is sort of the founder of complex systems here, and in some ways maybe of the entire field. And then a lot of recent work by Jessica Flack and David Krakauer at the Santa Fe Institute sort of saying, look, we feed all this stuff through, we take an action, and then that becomes our reality. So think back to the really cool video of the ants at the beginning, right? The ants are taking actions based on how they're parsing that information, and what is the reality? That's next, the reality is the ants all taking that information, and so it's just a constant feedback loop, okay? And then they may go like this, but then when they go like this, right? Then everybody else is going to do something else, then they may go like that, and it's going to continue to adapt. So Ian Cousin, who's also in that picture at the beginning, um, used to be at Princeton, now he's at a Max Planck Institute, he does this to study fish, right? So what you can think of, when you watch schooling a fish, what are those fish doing? Well, they're looking at patterns of other fish, right, just like those arrows, and then they're changing the direction they go based on how the other fish are moving. And if you put in different rules, they do different things. So... You can watch these videos sometimes that are like so amazing, right? It's hard to even believe they're true, right? Um, what's happening here is these starlings are following very simple rules, right? And creating these elaborate patterns. And one of the things we've learned from complex systems is if you just write a computer program and you put a little bunch of things in there and you give them rules to follow based on where other people are, you just get stuff like this, right? you just get these sort of amazing patterns. Now the point is, parts of this pattern are really functional, parts of this pattern are not functional at all. Right? If you sort of graphically represented behavior in middle school in the same way, it might look like this. <laughs> right? You'd see like everybody wearing a certain type of shoe, and everybody wearing a different kind of coat, and everybody cutting their hair, right? just moving around because everybody else is moving this around, but there also might be a handful of good things happening like people learning French or something like that. Okay. Now, this same idea happens like in an ecosystem, right? I like this particular one because the uh, sea otter is feeling pretty good. The, uh, 
But every one of these species is adapting to all the other species, right, and then defining the reality to which the other species adapt. The same is true with cancer, right? Your body is responding to cancer, cancer is responding to your body, right, and the whole system is constantly adapting. The same is true in the global economy. Each one of these industries is respond, responding to the other industries, right, in this sort of incredibly fast cycle. Now, the thing that gets hard about this, and this is why the theory is so difficult to construct, is things enter and exit all the time. So the space I know best in this is economics. This is the turnover in the Fortune 500. These are the 500 largest corporations in the, in the US. In 1955, if you went 10 years out, this is sort of the black line, you would have like 400 of those would still be in there, right? Starting in 1995, 14 years out, only 220 are still in there, right? So it's really hard to think about modeling these systems when like really big actors are moving in and out, right? The size of things are changing, the technology is changing, and so these things become, so we really don't, we know some things, but we don't know as much as we'd like to know. So let me talk then about sort of the challenges that come in related to diversity, and there's going to be several, okay? So the first is, one of the things we know in these systems is that success depends on diversity, but not in some idiosyncratic way. Success depends on having like the right types of diversity in the right way. And where does it enter? So one place it enters is sort of just these diverse experiences. So we think about those ants in the first case. Ants' experiences are spatial. They don't get a newspaper. They're not getting aggregate data. They don't have smartphones. It's a purely spatial thing. Each one of us lives in this incredibly data-rich environment Right, and we sort of choose which information we get. Right? So that's one place, just the information experiences we get are going to differ. Second place where it differs, and this is probably more important, is to make sense of that reality, we create representations. And so we create different representations. And so people who study ecosystems in depth will talk about how different species right, have different sensory apparatus and sort of see different parts of the space. Right? So birds have a you know, completely different visual system than we have. Right? So what you're getting, and if you, talk, if you, you know, see that if you're an economist, you see the world differently than if you're a sociologist, you see the world differently than if you're a physics, physicist, right? Once we have these representations, then what we do is we sort of build knowledge. And here's where diversity enters in a really sort of tricky way. So how we get trained, like if I, if I major in psychology or sociology or physics or women's studies or whatever, I'm going to learn a different class of models. I'm going to learn different ways to organize reality in my mind. But incentives are going to play a big role, right? So how I decide to look at things is going to depend on sort of like what's my interest in learning those things, right? And then the expertise I develop in terms of moving from knowledge to wisdom is probably also going to depend on my incentives, like where I work, what my job is, that sort of stuff. So let's go back then and rethink some of these examples. So let's go back to the partitioning case. How did MIT do this? It's a tiny place, right? Other people, Ashton Kushner was trying to do this. He had tons of Twitter followers, right? So he's like texting, anybody seen a red balloon? More people follow Ashton Kushner than go to MIT, okay? <laughs> so how did they do it? They did it through incentives for diversity. So they don't know that many people, but what they did is they said, okay, there's $40,000, 10 balloons, that's $4,000 a balloon, so here's what we'll do. Whoever finds the balloon, Dave down here, gets 2,000 bucks, gets half the value of the balloon. Whoever found Dave gets half of that, 1,000. Whoever found the person who found Dave gets half of that, which is 500, and on and on down the line. And if there's anything left over, MIT will keep it. But what they did is they created incentives, right, for all these people who lived all over the place. Hey, if I find a red balloon, I get 2,000 bucks, right? As did the other teams that didn't win, right? Everybody sort of used a system somewhat like this, or a lot of them used systems like this. Right? But the idea is to create incentives for people to go out there and look, right? To create incentives for people all over the country to go look for red balloons. This is a pretty good gig. Walk outside, see if you see a red balloon. If you do, you get $2,000, right? Okay. Let's go back to this wisdom of crowds thing. How did this happen? How did these people end up getting this right? Because this is, um, so Sir Wiki, Jim Sir Wiki writes this book. He says, when you look at these cases of smart crowds, what happens every single time is that they're diverse. That's like his big takeaway from this book. And it's takeaway, it's, what's remarkable about that is this takeaway from this book without him knowing the theorem, right? 
this is purely sort of an observational exercise. He says, wow, what's really interesting is that they just had different background knowledge. They were trained in different ways, right? Here, what probably happened is these people had just brought their own, again, steers to market, and they knew the way to their own steers, and psychologists will tell you, like, people suffer from an anchoring and adjustment bias, right? Like, if my steer weighs 1,000, I see another steer, I'm going to think it's near 1,000. If my steer weighs 1,300, I see another steer, I'm going to think that weighs near 1,300. So this is probably just an anchoring and adjustment bias. But here's where this kind of gets fun. So this is a recent paper by Dirk Helbing that um, replicates some work that um, I did with Maria Riolo here at Michigan in a cleaner way. So here's what Dirk does. He says, which is the same thing that we did. Suppose that reality consists of a whole bunch of different dimensions. So suppose that this is actually how um, Plato described guessing the weight of a steer. Suppose a steer consists of legs and a torso and a head and a neck and that you can figure out the weight of that by just summing up all those attributes. Now suppose each person has to have a model, right? Just like in our hierarchy. And their model consists of some subset of those attributes. The reason why, again, following Herb Simon, is that you can only keep in so much information in your head. So the way he wrote his model and the way we wrote our model is that there's a cost to adding attributes, right? The more attributes you add, the more accurate you are, right? But you pay more to look at more stuff. And then the question is, what if you give people then incentives to be correct? Like, so if you guess the weight of the cow correctly, if you guess the weight of this linear function correctly, you win money. So what you see here, this red line is the accuracy. So the lines on the left are showing you the accuracy and of these different markets. And what's going on here so is the following. They use entropy to sort of measure diversity here. If you say to people, just be right, we just want you to be right, you get this black line here, which is the one that's doing really, really badly. Because what happens is the most important part of the cow is going to be like the torso and the head. So if there's eight variables, like in this particular example, everybody looks at the two most important variables. Right? And if everybody looks at the two most important variables, everybody's looking at the same variables. Each person is smarter, but the crowd isn't very smart, right? Because it's not diverse. So the red line, the one that really works well, is what they do is they pay people for actually having a model that is different from other people's models. <laughs> so you're actually paying people for making the different predictions than other people make. So you're actually sort of incentivizing diversity, and that makes things correct. So this has been a real challenge within markets, within economies. You can think, oh, but markets work that way. Because if everybody's thinking the same way, I just want to think different than the other people, and I'll make a lot of money. That's the line in the middle, the blue line. Turns out markets create some incentives for diversity, right? But maybe not enough. And there may be other ways that you could get things better. So let's go back then to the Hayek quote, right? Hayek says, markets are amazing because people sort of accumulate this diverse knowledge. Well, our paper and his paper say, yes, yeah, some, but maybe not enough. Here's the key point. If the dimensionality is low, if there's only like three or four dimensions, markets work great. When you start turning that dimensionality knob up, they work less well. Right? And what you need to think about then is how do we create the right sort of incentives in those cases? Okay. Even ideological diversity works. This is a work by James Evans' group out of Chicago. This one's not published, but I'm putting it up anyway because he sent it to me. The graph on the right um, is the one to look at. On the, the thing on the bottom you can't read really, says polarization. So what they've got is they've got people who are left wing and right wing, and you ask, how good are we at predicting something? This is a political event based on. The po or I'm sorry, this is, these are Wikipedia articles. These are the quality of Wikipedia articles. I'm sorry, I've got this wrong. So it's like you've got a Wikipedia article and you've got a whole bunch of people who've edited it. You look at those people and you look at how ideologically diverse they are. Right? What you see is as you make them more ideologically diverse, moving along the bottom row, the article gets higher and higher in quality. Right? So if it's written all by Republicans or all by Democrats, it's not as good as if it's written by both. Okay. Here's the problem with diversity, though. Here's where it gets, and it's becoming more of a problem. I don't have to tell you, and assume this is a problem. There's, you know, there's lies out there. People make up data, right? In places you can't even imagine. So here was like, when you talk to Regina about the red balloon thing, here's the thing that gets completely freaked her out. Okay, you think, this is DARPA, it's fun, it's Ted Red Balloons, it's computer scientists. Who's going to lie about that? Pretty much everybody. <laughs> right? So the... The blue histogram are the true claims of balloons, and the red ones are the false ones. So even in that case, you get like 40% loss. 
And this is an indictment of America in a lot of ways. But, um, but it's, it's crazy, right? So the thing is, so when you see diversity, it's really hard to tell what is meaningful diversity and what is just somebody mailing it in or somebody strategically manipulating things, right? So one experiment, um, Rob Francis is in political science here, and I and Regina did one time, so we had people evaluating something for the military, and we then, we had a bunch of evaluations in, and then we paid people to evaluate to see if we could see differences between the people we paid to evaluate and the other people. And again, you see, I guess I'm not allowed to say what you see, but you see things, let me just say that. All right, so closing, then we'll have time for questions. So this is super cool, right? There's no doubt that this collective intelligence stuff is cool, and it's also this amazing opportunity, because it's basically saying, we have a logic, we have lots of data, we have this understanding of how the collections can be better. But the thing is, at universities, right, and this is Francis Bacon or Maxine Hong Kingston, whoever you want to choose, this really only becomes useful if we can take it to action, right? So how do we sort of change the world in positive ways, given that we know this? So the first thing is, you just can't believe in magic in this space. It's not like you can just throw a diverse set of people or create a crowdsourcing platform and expect something absolutely amazing to happen. Success really varies by type. If, you're, if you've got a thing where you're gonna get a whole bunch of people on board and you know you can and you're gonna partition, right? So something like Yelp, it's gonna work great, right? If you're just gonna aggregate things, like if you're gonna you know, create a prediction market, it's gonna work great. But as soon as you're trying to do intersections of things, right? Or as soon as you're trying to integrate knowledge, then it gets hard. And it gets hard fast. And so if you look at this, like Jeff Howe, who wrote the, this book called Crowdsourcing, and there's a new book out with Joey Ito that sort of pushes this further, he really beats this drum forcefully and strongly about how the, the real challenge here is figuring out this integration, right? And so, in some sense, don't believe the hype unless you're doing something fairly stable. I mean, if ants, I mean, it's my under, one of my undergrads said, what I learned from this class is that, like, if ants could do it, people probably aren't that bad at it. <laughs> right? No, and I think that's actually a good lesson to take from this. Second thing is, Plato famously said, what we do in science is we carve nature at the joints, right? That was true when we had, like, fire, rock, air, and water. But now that Brad has all these darn physical elements, right? Now, I mean, and now we have these social problems. There's no joints. If you carve this at its joints, you're going to be carving for the next 40 years, right? There's just way, it's, everything's too interconnected. So there, you can isolate things out and have one person study doesn't work. So we're, we're sort of forced, right, to go with collective intelligence. And the sheer growth in data and knowledge just demands it, right? So this is the total amount of data, and these are in exabytes, right? And it's like, what is an exabyte? I don't know. It's like, I mean, the... Uh, like a gigabyte is like every episode of The Simpsons. Um, a megabyte is like spending two weeks nonstop binging on like four Netflix shows. An exabyte is one fifth of every word ever spoken in human history. And there's 455 of them in a gram of DNA. <laughs> so when you think about right, how much information there is, how much data there is, right, there's no way we're going to get there um, alone. The sheer amount of knowledge for this, this is from 2011, but this is a number of scientific papers. I probably can't read this, but like, there's 300,000 papers, the, the big sort of circle of the United States there is 300,000 papers in science written in 2011. There's just so many papers written that there's no way any one person can understand much of it. Right? The other key lesson from this is we can't necessarily rely on the invisible hand because the invisible hand may push us in the same direction. And the lack of heterogeneity, lack of diversity can cause problems. This is this chart that's trending up here. These are the leverage ratios for different banks. The blue one is uh, Lehman Brothers, the yellow one is Bear Stearns, both of which went public. The leverage ratio is just sort of like how much money you've got out based on how much you've got in house. So if you only own 5% of your house, your leverage ratio is 20. If you own 50% of your house, your leverage ratio is two their leverage ratios were 30. They own 3% of their house. And guess what? Markets collapsed. Now you think, why did they do this? Look at Merrill Lynch. In 2003, their leverage ratio was 15. Why in 2007 is their leverage ratio 30? Well, guess who made a lot more money than they did in 2004, 2005, and 2006? Lehman and Bear Stearns. Why? Because they had bigger leverage ratios. So we can't necessarily count on the invisible hand, right, to always point everybody in we really want the invisible hand to be pointing us in different directions, and sometimes it points us in the same direction. The last thing is, 
System functionality depends on good diversity. So this isn't about just kind of random diversity. It's about having the right types of diversity in the right places. And one of the real interesting things that, so like I hang out here in complex systems and at Santa Fe in complex systems, one of the things we sort of think, sit and think about is to what extent do markets, political systems, organizations, ecosystems construct incentives? How do they do it? How do they sort of balance this need for exploiting what are really good solutions and at the same time exploring different solutions but at the population level, right, creating a set of actors that are doing different stuff? They're looking at different data, creating different information, right? Constructing different models. And then, how does it integrate, right? So it's not just about having sort of diversity up that triangle, but it's also sort of getting the right integration at the top. All right, thank you very, very much.